Well, good morning, all. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I am happy to, to uh, announce that I am joined here today by Secretary Penny Pritzker from the Department of Commerce, Secretary Tom Vilsack from the Department of Agriculture, Administrator Gina McCarthy of the Environmental Protection Agency, Deputy Secretary Michael Connor from the Department of the Interior, Admiral Paul Zukunft, Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard, who also in 2010 served as the federal on-scene coordinator for the Deepwater Horizon spill, and Assistant Attorney General John Cruden of the Justice Department's Environmental and Natural Resources Division. Quite a team because we have quite an announcement. We are here today to announce a major step forward in our efforts to deliver justice to the Gulf region in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon tragedy, the largest environmental disaster that our nation has ever endured. Five and a half years ago, the world watched as the Deepwater Horizon oil rig exploded, burned, and then sank into the Gulf of Mexico. Deep below the surface, BP's Macondo well had blown out and was gushing oil into the Gulf. The oil began spreading hundreds of miles from the well, coating the seafloor, forming vast slicks across the surface and staining more than 1,300 miles of coastline. With that explosion, lives were lost. The Gulf was flooded with oil, and the Gulf Coast way of life, a uniquely American way of life, was hanging by a thread. Over the course of nearly three months, the Gulf region was inundated with more than three million barrels of oil. And by the time the torrent stopped, it had inflicted unprecedented harm on the economy, on the environment, and on the population of the Gulf region. Ecosystems were disrupted, businesses were shuttered, and countless men and women lost their livelihoods and their sense of security. And that is why in December of 2010, the Department of Justice filed a lawsuit against BP to hold the company accountable and to provide vital relief for the people of the Gulf region. And that is exactly what we did. At trial, our litigation team proved that the spill was the result of BP's gross negligence. But our efforts did not stop with the issue of liability. Ensuring that liability translated into real relief for all of the inhabitants of the Gulf, the people, the businesses, and the fish and wildlife was the essential next step. Today, I am pleased to announce that we have secured a historic resolution of our pending claims against BP, totaling more than $20 billion, making it the largest settlement with a single entity in American history. The resolution includes civil claims under the Clean Water Act, for which BP has agreed to pay a $5.5 billion penalty, the largest civil penalty in the history of environmental law. It includes natural resources damages claims under the Oil Pollution Act, for which BP has agreed to pay $7.1 billion, on top of the $1 billion it had previously committed to pay for early restoration work. And it includes economic damages claims, for which BP has agreed to pay $4.9 billion to the five Gulf states and up to $1 billion to local governments. Once approved by the court, this agreement will launch one of the largest environmental restoration efforts the world has ever seen. Under the Restore Act, 80% of the $5.5 billion Clean Water Act penalty will go to help the Gulf recover from the injuries that it has suffered. In addition, BP's payments for the natural resources damages will fund Gulf restoration projects that will revitalize damaged habitats such as coastal wetlands, and support the revival of wildlife populations, including marine mammals, sea turtles, oysters, and birds. This work will be guided by a comprehensive restoration plan that we are also announcing today, and which was developed by a trustee council made up of four federal agencies, all here today, and trustees from all five Gulf states. Taken as a whole, this resolution is both strong and fitting. BP is receiving the punishment it deserves, while also providing critical compensation for the injuries that it caused to the environment and the economy of the Gulf region. The steep penalty should inspire BP and its peers to take every measure necessary to ensure that nothing like this can ever happen again. And the resolution's focus on restoring the vitality of the affected areas will add to the important relief work that's already underway. 
It will provide significant resources to assist the region's ongoing recovery, and it will help to ensure that Gulf communities emerge from this disaster stronger and more resilient than ever before. I'm tremendously proud that the Department of Justice has helped to lead the way from tragedy to opportunity, and I am exceedingly thankful for the many partnerships that were crucial to achieving this result. And I'm confident that the resolution that we have announced today will restore, it will preserve, and it will protect the precious Gulf environment for many generations to come. Now, obviously, today's extraordinary resolution would not have been possible without the tireless efforts of the Deepwater Horizon trial team, which is comprised of remarkable women and men from the Justice Department's Environment and Natural Resources Division and also our Civil Division. I would also like to recognize and to thank our outstanding partners at the EPA, at the Departments of Commerce, Agriculture, Interior and Homeland Security, and in state and local governments throughout the Gulf region. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge my predecessor, Eric Holder, who launched this case five years ago and faithfully supervised it for the remainder of his tenure as Attorney General. And at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce the Secretary of Commerce, Penny Pritzker, who will provide additional details on today's announcement. Madam Secretary. Thank you very much, Attorney General Lynch, for welcoming us all to the Department of Justice and for your leadership in this remarkable settlement. I also want to thank my colleagues from across the cabinet and all of our teams who have spent five years and thousands of hours working with state partners in this effort. Today marks a historic milestone for the people, businesses, and environment of the Gulf region. Five years after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, this settlement reaffirms our administration's clear, ongoing, and unwavering commitment to securing justice for the Gulf communities to spurring economic growth across Gulf states, and to ensuring the Gulf Coast comes back stronger and more vibrant than ever. Home to ample energy resources and 10 of America's 15 largest ports, the Gulf Coast is absolutely critical to the prosperity of our entire nation. From the start, the Department of Commerce has played a central role in local, state, and federal government efforts to restore the region's ecosystem and revitalize its economy. With our partners, we established the Restore Council, which I chair. This agency has made $183 million available for essential projects and programs, such as skills training for local communities, improvements in water quality and habitat restoration for fish, birds, and wildlife. Through our department's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, we have worked with our state and federal partners on the Natural Resources Damages Assessment Team to invest over $800 million of BP early restoration funds in the Gulf's natural resources. Through our Economic Development Administration, teams were on the ground in the Gulf states to learn firsthand what local communities needed to revive their economies and draw investments to their markets. That information guided investment of over $466 million in workforce development partnerships and assistance for entrepreneurs in high-wage, high-growth industries across the region. There, these are only some of the steps that we have taken in close cooperation with local, state, and federal partners to reinvigorate the Gulf. We know there's still far more to do, and with this settlement of more than $20 billion, our work continues. Now we can move forward with more effective restoration planning, large-scale projects, and smart investments in economic development and environmental resilience. Today, as part of this settlement, leaders from Commerce, from the agencies represented here, and from the five states of the Gulf region are proposing a national, a natural res re resources restoration plan. This proposal is rooted in the best available science and hard data. 
information needed to assess the damage from the oil spill, determine the best course of action, and make smart funding decisions throughout the Gulf. Our plan will make $8.1 billion of investments across the Gulf Coast and in the open ocean to restore coastal and nearshore habitats, improve water quality in coastal wetlands, protect and recover marine resources, and enhance recreational use opportunities. Together, these initiatives will build on our efforts of the last five years to move Gulf communities from recovery to restoration to resurgence. This unprecedented settlement offers an unprecedented opportunity. An opportunity to set a course for economic sustainability and resilience for the Gulf Coast now and into the future. An opportunity to ensure the health and prosperity of the Gulf region over the long term. An opportunity to restore the environment, reinvigorate the economy, create jobs in Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, Florida, and Alabama in all of the communities affected by the disaster. Seizing this opportunity will require coordination, partnership, and innovation across all levels of government, the private sector, and the people who live and work in the Gulf. Let's work together to keep the Gulf Coast growing, thriving, and open for business. And now I'd like to introduce our Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary Vilsack. I want to thank uh, Attorney General Lynch uh, and her uh, fabulous team uh, for the opportunity to be here this morning. You may wonder why it's uh, necessary for the Department of Agriculture to be represented here. Now, the reality is that 80% of the private land that is impacted and affected by the Gulf oil spill is privately owned and it's private working lands. It's the place where we, uh, at the Department of Agriculture, partner with farmers and ranchers and producers uh, to make sure that their land continues to be productive. Following the spill, uh, the Department of Agriculture worked very hard to restore habitat. Uh, there was a significant problem with wildlife, particularly uh, ducks, geese. Uh, we helped to restore a flyway, uh, which led to literally tens of millions of additional birds uh, being able to, uh, to uh, live uh, and to promote the opportunities of recreation that are so important and vital to the uh, Gulf Coast area. The Attorney General's team uh, has done an incredible job. Uh, this is obviously not easy litigation, uh, and I think the level of the settlement reflects the importance that her team has placed uh, on this national treasure. Uh, Penny Pritzker and the Department of Commerce uh, is going to provide great leadership with the Restore Council, and I'm here today just simply to indicate that the Department of Agriculture uh, and the Natural Resource Conservation Service and the Forest Service are prepared uh, with 3,700 people uh, in every single county uh, that's impacted by this to work in collaboration uh, to renew, to refresh, to revitalize the Gulf Coast. Uh, it's a natural treasure not just for the Gulf Coast states but for the entire country. Uh, this is an important settlement uh, and we have important work to do. So we're excited about the possibility and the opportunity to make the Gulf Coast even better than it was prior to the spill. But without the great work of the Department of Justice we wouldn't be here today and without the leadership uh, Penny Pritzker and the other federal agencies, uh, we wouldn't be in the position we're in today. Someone who's going to have a great deal of responsibility uh, in connection with the recovery uh, efforts will be the Environmental Protection Agency, who is led by uh, someone who is tenacious, uh, who is focused on ensuring the environment is protected and has done an incredible job as administrator, uh, my good friend Gina McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, and let me begin by thanking Attorney General Lynch as well as DOJ's ongoing leadership, especially John Cruden, who has been an outstanding uh, leader in the Gulf uh, region states for all of their cooperation over the past five years. I'm also grateful to have such hardworking colleagues across the departments and agencies who are represented here today. You know, I also want to recognize the tremendous leadership of Lisa Jackson, uh, during this event, as she well knows and all of us remember, uh, the BP oil spill was a tremendous 
tragedy and plain and simple. Along with the devastating toll on human life, the spill drove Gulf communities into a period, a period of painful uncertainty, forcing questions that no American family should ever have to ask. Is my food safe to eat? Is it dangerous for my kids to play near the shore? Is the air still clean to breathe? And will my businesses ever recover? Today is a day of justice for every family in every community whose health, land, water, and livelihoods were threatened by the BP oil spill. And no amount of money can erase the fear and the loss that they endured, but it can help them to recover and to rebuild. Justice is not about dumping a pile of money and walking away. It's about investing in sustainable ways that empower and that strengthen the Gulf communities over the long term. That's why along with billions of dollars that will be distributed over the next 15 years, that we're releasing a 15-year Gulf restoration plan. This plan will help make sure that settlement funds are deployed in that ways that make a lasting difference. Justice is about making the necessary changes to prevent a disaster from this from happening again. And you'll recall that after the spill, BP was barred from doing business with the U.S. government. In reaching an agreement to lift the suspension, EPA vigorously pursued and achieved a set of requirements BP must now follow to make sure they do not repeat this disaster. Today's agreement will include critical transparency measures that will hold BP openly accountable to these obligations and will make sure everyone knows that taking the required steps to do better in the future are actually happening and on time. To close, today is a sober triumph for the Clean Water Act and the Oil Pollution Act. They are cornerstones of EPA's work. Every day, these and other laws are what allow EPA to pursue our mission of protecting people's health and environment. And I want to thank the great team at EPA for delivering and working on this wonderful agreement. This consent decree is a demonstration of our nation's environmental laws hot at work on behalf of the American people. Today, they are bringing justice to the people of the Gulf. Let me turn now and ask Mike Connor, who is the Deputy Secretary of the Interior, to offer some remarks. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you, Madam Attorney General, for your leadership and the leadership of your team uh, with working with all the federal agencies and our state counterparts to, to uh, bring together this uh, historic uh, event and this uh, historic consent decree that got filed today. I am pleased, uh, representing the Interior Department, to uh, join the announcement of this historic settlement. Not only is it a tre tremendous victory for the Gulf, uh, the citizens of this nation. It's also a tremendous victory for restoration and conservation of the nation's, nation's precious land, water, and wildlife resources. As you've heard, the Deepwater Horizon spill was the largest oil spill and environmental disaster in our country's history. A tragedy that claimed the lives of 11 men also uh, soiled more than 43 square miles of the Gulf region and damaged more than 1,300 miles of coastline between Texas and Florida. Today's announcement represents great progress as we move towards restoration and remediation efforts in the Gulf, but it's equally important to ensure that history does not repeat itself. In response to the Deepwater Horizon tragedy, Interior launched aggressive and comprehensive over, uh, reforms to our offshore oil and gas regulation and oversight activities. DOI restructured its regulatory approach to prevent incidents like this from occurring again and to ensure that the United States can safely and responsibly develop its oil and gas resources offshore. Now we have two independent regulatory agencies, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, BESI, and the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management, BOEM. Both have clear missions and are better resourced than their institutional, institutional predecessor, the Minerals Management Service. BESI is steeped in a culture of, of safety and while is ensuring the highest technological standards are followed by the industry. BOEM is focused on ensuring that industry plans for exploration and production contain robust environmental safeguards based on the best available science. In short, we are enhancing drilling and workplace safety in the Gulf region. We remain committed to continuous improvement and will continue to engage the industry and all stakeholders to make sure our regulatory process enables safe and responsible development offshore. Today, as you've also heard, we're moving forward with our restoration and remediation efforts and making very good 
value of the investments that are being made pursuant to today's consent decree. As you've heard, the Deepwater Horizon Natural Resources Damage Assessment Trustee Council filed the draft programmatic natural resources assessment uh, draft plan and the draft EIS. Comments are being taken through December 4th. The plan provides a framework for how the trustees will use the $8.1 billion made available in the consent decree to provide natural resources damage recoveries in the Gulf. In addition, I'd like to point out the Gulf Coast Rest Ecosystem Rest Restoration Council, the Restore Council, published a regulation a week ago which established a formula for allocating resources according to representing oil shoreline uh, that was uh, occurred during the uh, tragedy. So that formula will allocate, distribute a portion of the 80% of the 5.5 billion that's going forward to be invested under the Restore program. These actions represent a critical path forward in our restoration and conservation of natural resources. As the Attorney General and others have noted, nothing can undo the dislocation, anxiety, and uncertainty the spill caused for families, businesses, and communities across the Gulf region. But the proposed settlement accomplishes exactly what the environmental laws are supposed to do. Interior Department is appreciative of being part of this historic effort and looks forward to the restoration efforts moving forward. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Paul, Admiral Paul Zukup with the United States Coast Guard, who has a long history in this matter, as you've heard earlier today. Thank you, Attorney General Lynch, and I really want to thank everybody here who represents whole of government. Uh, five and a half years ago, I was there. Uh, and this is before and this is after, but this is emblematic of what whole of government can do, whole of federal government. Uh, in a period of time when I look back to when I was working with then Attorney General Holder, uh, when I was working with our Department of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano, Secretary of Interior, Ken Salazar, Jane Luchenko, and among others, uh, they're not here with us today but their work, their vision, uh, has really made this historic day possible. Uh, so I'll just take you back five and a half years ago as a federal on-scene coordinator for what was then the worst environmental tragedy in United States history. And I want to just share with you from the eyes of the nearly 45,000 responders that answered to this spill. Many of them lived in these communities. Many of them worked in the offshore oil industry. Many of them were fishermen. Many of them relied on tourism, and they saw their way of life being eroded and perhaps irreversibly changed. And I tried to assure them during that time that, yes, we will emerge from this worst tragedy better than we found it. And that was our job during this response, is to return the Gulf better than we had found it. Now, it had been 25 years since I had been in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, I was a commercial fisherman when I was lieutenant in the Coast Guard, and I would have to go through a labyrinth of wetlands to get out into the Gulf of Mexico. And when I looked out at Barataria Bay, there was the Gulf of Mexico, and gone were those wetlands. As we look at how pristine this environment is and how vital it is to this ecosystem, and clearly this was not a problem that the United States Coast Guard could serve on its own. But our members, we live in these communities. We continue to respond to episodic oiling related to this oil spill as I stand before you today. But today is indeed a milestone day in United States history. We have turned the corner. Not only turned the corner, but there is a restoration plan in place. I know what it takes with environmental impact studies to get this critical work done and to get it done in a timely manner. Uh, and this is nothing less than a Herculean effort across whole of government to make this day possible because at the end of the day, it's those communities on the Gulf Coast who five and a half years ago said our way of life has changed and today they will wake up and say, yes, our way of life has changed for the better. So again, I thank you and I thank all of the team members here that made this day possible. Thank you and Semper Paratus. All right, questions today. Uh, Devlin? Attorney General, um, the company has long valued this deal at $18.7 billion. Could you just explain the discrepancy in, in the valuations? 
Surely, you'll see that today's announcement is a little over $20 billion. The company did reserve a little over $18 billion uh, earlier this year in an initial estimation. Over time, we've refined those numbers. We've also added in amounts of money that the company had already provided for restoration uh, to the Gulf. So that's why you see this. So simply over time, we do refine numbers, uh, and we do feel this is a much more exact number. Some uh, localities that were holding out and, and, and sort of fighting for the, the prospect of more money. Um, are there any remaining holdouts, any parishes in Louisiana that are not covered that didn't want to be part of this, or is every single jurisdiction uh, part of this now? Well, I believe that also today the five Gulf states are announcing their own resolutions, which we are covering in this also. So I'd have to defer you to their specific announcements as well. Um, there certainly may be some. I just don't have the particulars on that. And certainly we hope that they can find resolution. If I'm doing my math right, this comes out to about $155 per barrel spilled. What was the maximum you could have sought under federal law? Well, thanks for the math. <laughs> <laughs> um, certainly, if, if you look at the initial case where we did find liability, the maximum penalty would have been a little over $13 billion. That would have been, that would have had to have been um, upheld, would have had to have been found by the court, upheld on appeal, and it would have significantly uh, not accounted for the delays in getting recovery to the Gulf. This is still the largest environmental penalty under the Clean Water Act and Oil Pollution Act ever. It is significantly higher than the penalties exacted for the Exxon Valdez disaster, which people often compare this to. And so we feel that this will, with the cooperation of the agencies here and the Gulf states, lead to real relief for the people and the citizens and the businesses of the Gulf. The EPA has indicated they have some updated numbers, which may be helpful to you. Let me turn it over to Gina McCarthy for that information. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to indicate that, that uh, we have great respect for the media. We disagree a little bit on the numbers here. Um, <laughs> EPA's calculation is that it's actually $1,725 per barrel of oil spilled. That was close. <laughs> I wish you gave us that kind of latitude when we do things. <laughs> I got that number from the Wall Street Journal, by the way. <laughs> what, what would have been, if, if that's the total, could you have sought more under federal law? What's the maximum per barrel you could have sought is what I'm trying to find out. You know, the, the penalties are not really allocated on a per barrel basis. It's an aggregate of all the damage incurred, and we get submissions on that. As I indicated before, I think that certainly the maximum we could have gotten had, if we had we stayed in court and fought this to the bitter end uh, for several more years, we could have gotten an award statutorily of over $13 billion. Again, that was assuming that the court would have awarded that amount of money. That is close to the maximum under the statute we could have gotten, looking at the kind of damage that was incurred here. And again, it would have had to have been upheld on appeal for us to have recovered that amount of money. So those, are, those certainly are numbers that are available under the statute, but we felt that this resolution coming in with the highest amount of a penalty ever would let us get the money to the Gulf right away. <laughs> you had your hand up. I'd like to ask uh, Ms. McCarthy and the Admiral, what is the state of the uh, Gulf today? I mean, we talked a lot about how much is being done. What, how much damage is still there? How, how would you how would you estimate it? Um, the last report of oil oiling we had actually was back in March in Barataria Bay of 2015. Uh, a tar mat that came ashore that we could match to Macondo 252 oil. Uh, the fishing industry has reopened uh, and it has reopened with resurgence. Uh, tourism is back like actually never before. Uh, the coastal states, uh, especially in Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, had banner years for, for tourism as well. Um, but what has not recovered are these wetlands, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, which is going to take time. Uh, and when you look at the ecosystems that are dependent upon those wetlands to sustain fisheries well into the 21st century, 
that work is going to be absolutely critical. So much work now needs to be done on the restore aspect of this oil spill, but much of the response work is in fact complete. Uh, but if oil does come ashore, uh, we take those calls and we respond as we do to all oil spills in the United States. Uh, very quickly, let me just add that, that, that the reason you have $8.1 billion in restoration funds is because there's a lot of work that needs to be done. But let me just add, there's also an additional $700 million that's built into this agreement. Should there be unforeseen impacts or damages that we did not anticipate that required work? Yeah, can I? You know, I think one of the uh, issues that may not be fully appreciated is what this settlement will do in terms of spurring other folks to think differently about conservation. Uh, we know from uh, an ag perspective that we now have farmers and producers far more sensitive uh, to what they can do with their land. And this resource is going to encourage, I think, more conservation than would otherwise have taken place. So there's not only going to be a direct impact on how the oil spill uh, affected the wetlands, but there's also going to be a positive impact on the ecosystem that feeds into those wetlands. And I think you're going to see significant uh, increases in habitat. That's in turn going to substantially increase hunting and fishing uh, and recreational opportunities, and that's going to tie into the uh, Admiral's comments about tourism. Um, on another topic, you and Administrator McCarthy are working on another high-profile investigation at the moment into Volkswagen. Um, I guess subverting U.S. environmental laws, and I'm wondering if you could talk a bit, you and the administrator talked a bit about the status of the investigation, um, you know, what level of cooperation you guys are getting from Volkswagen, and whether you can even proceed criminal charges at the moment, because I know you were not able to obtain them against GM. Well, what I can say, certainly Administrator McCarthy can speak about uh, the actions that have already been taken regarding Volkswagen which are public. At this point, the Department of Justice is working very closely with the EPA to review these matters. We will review all the evidence, all the facts, uh, and pursue whatever remedies uh, we find available under the law. And since this is something that we're looking at right now, I'm not able to go into details about that. But it is something that we take very, very seriously. Do you want to add anything on that? No? Okay. And then behind you. you had your... uh, for the uh, restoration plan, how specific does this get in telling states how they're going to go about restoring these wetlands? Are we going to be to see further announcements from them on the fine-grained details of how they how they'll be doing this, or does this lay it all out there? Well, what I would do is I would I would um, hope that people would go to the website and look at the restoration plan. Again, as I indicated earlier, the four agencies that are here and all five states are involved in that. And while the restoration plan talks about the type of things that it will focus on, in, in particular, whether it is it is about a certain type of mammal or fish, um, it does not define the specific projects now, because we want every state to be able to look at, at the harm that they suffered and come up with the best plan and pick the best ways of solving their particular issues. So the, the plan does outline broad categories, uh, and we expect to work very, very closely with the Restoration Council, uh, which is chaired by the Secretary of Commerce here. I don't know if you want anything, if you have anything you want to add to that, um, but we will, we also anticipate that the states will be very involved in deciding the actual ways in which the recovery money will be spent. Yes. Um, thanks. Uh, the FBI yesterday put out a statement uh, regarding uh, an online post that was uh, uh, allegedly threatening uh, Philadelphia area colleges, universities. Um, I want to see if you care to comment on that. And also, um, is FBI monitoring any other similar? Uh, online posts uh, to any other colleges, universities throughout the country? Well, I'm, I'm going to refer you to the FBI statement for that. And what I will say is that in this time of, uh, of heightened sensitivity, uh, we are taking all steps necessary and appropriate to make sure that we are aware of threats, no matter how they may be transmitted. But I'll refer you back to the FBI statement on that. And behind you. Uh, Administrator McCarthy, you mentioned transparency requirements on BP. Is that part of the settlement, and can you detail what the transparency requirements are? Well, as you know, there were prior agreements, uh, both a, a, the criminal uh, plea agreement as well as EPA's debarment um, agreement uh, with BP um, that were actually reinforced through this particular agreement because it did p build transparency and accountability mechanisms. In particular, it requires BP to report and keep that accurate on a publicly accessible website. So you will be able to see yourself what kind of actions that BP has initiated and how it is complying with the settlement agreement. 
So that's the ultimate of transparency. Let me ask you on another subject as well. Given the president's comments last week about uh, his concern about guns and mass shootings, is the Justice Department doing anything to come up with regulations or policies the White House could look at? Well, certainly the president speaks for the administration in terms of policy, and I think um, his statement was clear and it was strong that this is a matter of grave concern and that everyone should be focused on how we can make our country safer overall. As the president indicated, we are always looking at ways in which we can um, mount the strongest cases possible under our existing laws. And certainly it's an ongoing debate, it's an ongoing discussion. Um, hard to say where it will end, but certainly the Department of Justice looks forward to working to continue to keep the American people safe. And then behind you. So, so much of the science of the injury related to this bill has been tied up in the litigation. Uh, will this draft restoration plan lay out what the government believes the damage from this bill to have been? And will that $8.1 billion related to the Oil Pollution Act, a one-for-one -one restoration, will that cover the damage that we see here? Well, I, I certainly can, can leave it to Penny. Um, I think one point should be made is that this is going out for public comment and there is a public process so would encourage everybody to be engaged in that. Uh, also, the, the Restoration Council is very robust in terms of, of having every stakeholder at the table to work through these issues. Uh, the Restoration Plan does take account of what we believe to be the impacts associated with the spill, but also keep in mind that beyond the 8.1 million and potential 700, there is also a settlement that's been reached by the individual communities, and there's a settlement that has been, been an economic settlement that has been reached. So there is uh, certainly in total uh, about $30 billion that are, is really going to be focused on this issue and getting the Gulf the kind of justice it deserves. Uh, I just wanted to see if you had a view on what impact this settlement may have on future oil production in the Gulf and whether or not the settlement had an intent of discouraging future production. Well, the settlement is not, not, um, not designed to discourage uh, any valid economic activity in the Gulf, and certainly the oil production that takes place there is also a val valid and valued part of the American economy. What it is designed to do, however, is to not only compensate for the damages and provide for a way forward for the health and safety of the Gulf, but let other companies know that they are going to be responsible for the harm that incurs should, should uh, accidents like this happen in the future. So we hope that they will look at this. We hope that they will look at um, not only the settlement, but also the steps that BP has taken in terms of transparency, in terms of changes in procedures, and ensure that they're operating in as safe a manner as possible. Last week in an interview, you were asked why there aren't national figures on police shootings or reliable national figures on police shootings, and you said you didn't think the Justice Department should dictate minutia to departments. Do you really think police shootings are minutia? Well, let me be clear. Police shootings are not minutia at all. Um, and the department's position and the administration's position has consistently been that the need to have national consistent data, both on excessive force and officer-involved shootings, is vital. Uh, this information is useful because it helps us see trends, it helps us promote accountability and transparency. Uh, the point that I was trying to make at, at that uh, conference related to our overall view of how we deal with police departments um, as part, of our, um, as part of, of our practice of enforcing either consent decrees or working with them. And I was trying to make the point that we also have to focus on building community trust, which is a very individual, very local um, uh, practice. Unfortunately, my comments gave the misperception that we were changing our view in some way about the importance of this data. Nothing could be further from the truth. This data is, is not only vital, we are actually working very closely with law enforcement to develop national consistent standards for collecting this kind of information. So do you think the department should be compelled to provide that sort of data? Should there be a, a should it be a requirement for, for departments to, to say? 
Well, we do require it when we have consent decrees with departments, and frankly, we find it very, very useful as we look at data and trends, and as we publish our consent decrees, we encourage other departments to do so. And frankly, police departments also are finding it useful. Certainly, the fact that we don't have a nationwide consistent set of standards is not only does it make our job difficult, it makes it hard to see these trends, and that's why it is so important to focus on these, and that's why we are working through the department's research arm, our Bureau of Justice Statistics and the FBI are working with the leading police organizations, International Association of Chiefs of Police, major city chiefs, major county sheriffs, um, to look at these standards. And we're also going further and, and developing standards for publishing information about deaths in custody as well, because transparency and accountability are helped by this kind of national data. Um, Devlin took my question, but I have another one. Um, there's been a, a consistent stream of information leaking out about the Department of Justice's inquiry into Hillary uh, Clinton's email storage. Most of this information is negative. It's having an impact on her campaign. Are you concerned about those leaks, and what, if anything, are you doing to prevent any more information from getting out about this inquiry? Well, look, I think leaks are detrimental to any matter, no matter what it is, no matter who is involved, uh, because everyone wants to have matters conducted in the way that the department always does, which is thoroughly, fairly, efficiently, uh, and with a view towards whatever the appropriate resolution is going to be. So beyond that, I'm not able to comment uh, on any specifics of the matter. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.